Hello, everyone. In this session, I'm going to discuss about hydrocephalus in children. So, as an introduction, hydrocephalus was believed to result from an imbalance between cerebrospinal fluid production and absorption, so that there is net accumulation of fluid in the cranial cavity. Because of that, there is increase in size of the cerebral ventricles and elevate, elevation of intracranial pressure. And if the age is less, there is increase of the head size as well. So recently, the concept of, uh, concepts have changed. Hydrocephalus has more broadly been defined as a disturbance of formation, flow, or absorption of CSF, not just formation and absorption. So this cumulatively leads to an increase in volume occupied by this fluid in the CNS and excludes other abnormalities of CSF dynamics, such as benign intracranial hypertension in which the ventricles are not enlarged. Right. So this is the current uh, concept of or uh, thought about hydrocephalus. Conditions such as cerebral atrophy and focal destructive lesions can also result in an abnormal increase of CSF in the CNS. So these things have to be excluded. In these situations, Ventricular dilation is not an active process, so the loss of cerebral tissue leads to a vac vacant space that is filled passively with CSF. So this is called hydrocephalus ex vacuo or just ventriculomegaly, but not really hydrocephalus. So this is because this is not as uh, the result of a hydrodynamic disorder. Therefore, it is not classified as hydrocephalus. So this is rightly termed uh, ventriculomegaly or hydrocephalus ex vacuo. So how do you classify hydrocephalus? Hydrocephalus can be classified as communicating versus non-communicating. It can also be classified as obstructive versus absorptive, that is non-obstructive. Uh, I'll tell you which is used these days in the next slide. Acquired versus congenital is another way of classifying based on the etiology and genetic or CNS malformation associated versus isolated. That is, uh, hydrocephalus has a systemic uh, problem rather than uh, only a brain problem uh, is what is classified with this particular uh, classification. And extraventricular versus intraventricular is one way of classifying. So currently we classify hydrocephalus as communicating and non-communicating or extraventricular and intraventricular. We uh, do not classify it as obstructive and non-obstructive because there is some obstruction at some level in most cases of hydrocephalus. Only hydrocephalus where there is no obstruction is probably that due to a choroid plexus, you know, carcinoma or papilloma, where there's overproduction of CSF. Whereas in most uh, cases of hydrocephalus, there is obstruction. It, depending on the site of obstruction, it is classified as intraventricular, or extraventricular, or communicating or non-communicating. We don't use the word obstructive and non-obstructive. So in a communicating hydrocephalus, the site of obstruction is extraventricular, that is outside the ventricles. That is the site of the arachnoid granulation, where the vent... Uh, the CSF is absorbed into the venous sinuses. For example, after a hemorrhage, there is blockade of these arachnoid granulations by the hemorrhagic residue, and that leads to hydrocephalus. Right? So non-communicating or intraventricular hydrocephalus is one in which the site of obstruction is the ventricular level. An example is aqueductal stenosis, that is obstruction of the third ventricle as a congenital malformation. Uh, because of that, there is hydrocephalus uh, proximally. So before discussing hydrocephalus in detail, one condition which resembles uh, hydrocephalus is called BES or benign extraaxial fluid collection or benign uh, extracranial or uh, benign extraventricular subarachnoid space collection. So benign enlargement of subarachnoid spaces is what BES stands for. So this is abnormal enlargement of the head and excessively large subarachnoid space, but the ventricles remain normal. Right. So this is one cause of a large head in infants, but this is not ventriculomegaly or this is not hydrocephalus. In infants whose neurological development is normal and the enlargement of subarachnoid space resolves by two years, no further requirement of uh, any workup or treatment is necessary. In infants whose neurological development is abnormal in these conditions or in whom enlargement of subarachnoid space does not resolve by 24 months, further investigation may be warranted. There are certain conditions with present uh, with a large head and also has best as a radiological finding. So this include mucopolysaccharidosis, achondroplasia, Soto syndrome or cerebral gigantism, glutaric aciduria type 1. So this can be a finding in these uh, uh, patients as well. But they have other neurological systemic as well as radiological findings with which they are easily diagnosable. Among this, you should remember MPS, that is mucopolysaccharidosis and glutaric aciduria type 1, which are treatable entities if identified at the right time. 
So coming to hydrocephalus proper, let's discuss the epidemiology. The incidence of pediatric hydrocephalus has declined in many developed countries because of they are able to avoid the main uh, chunks of hydrocephalus patients, that is post-hemorrhagic or post-meningitic hydrocephalus, particularly in uh, preterm infants or in the neonatal age group. Because This is because of good antenatal screening, genetic testing and pregnancy termination for those with uh, severe anomalies of the CNS as well as, you know, extracranial structures. Also because neural tube defects have been prevented by folate supplementation and also better preterm care so that we are avoiding the complications of IVH or neonatal meningitis. In newborns, overall incidence of hydrocephalus would be something around 0.3 to 4 per 1,000 live births, which is still a big number. So let's discuss CSF dynamics. So CSF is produced by two mechanisms. Most of the CSF is thought to be secreted by the choroid plexus within the cerebral ventricles. Extra choroidal CSF production is also possible. This is in the subarachnoid sites and by way of a transependymal route. So this also has been documented, but it is not clear how this operates. About 20% of more of CSF is said to be derived from extracellular fluid in the brain, created as a byproduct of cerebral metabolism. Normally, rates of production is around 0.35 ml per minute or approximately around 500 ml per day. And absorption of CSF is equal. Hence, the net volume does not change from time to time. Total CSF volume is 65 to 140. It varies in children as well as in adults where it is 90 to 150. So, Discussing more about CSF dynamics. So the process of CSF formation is by the choroid plexus. It is an energy dependent process. It is initiated by hydrostatic pressure in the choroidal capillaries and by active transport of sodium. The enzymes, sodium potassium, ATPase and carbonic anhydrase partly regulate the CSF secretion. These two are important enzymes. By contrast, the process of CSF reabsorption is not an active process. It was initially thought to be an energy independent process by passive absorption to the arachnoid granulations. But now, with information gained from MRI analysis of CSF movement, demonstrates some pulsatile to and fro motion of CSF within the lateral ventricles produced by a brain pumping motion that ejects CSF and causes an end downward flow. So, the uh, arterial pulsations which are transmitted to the brain parenchyma and then to the ventricles help in an active movement of CSF egress. So water and electrolytes pass freely. Larger proteins and macromolecules are selectively transported across the cytoplasm of endothelial cells by an active process uh, involving micropinocytosis. Evidence emerging that arachnoid granulations only have a secondary role. This is again a change of uh, uh, change of concept, a very uh, dynamic uh, change of concept that the arachnoid granulations, which have been believed to be the site of CSF resorption, only have a secondary role. The olfactory nerves, the cribriform plate, the nasal lymphatics have been identified as important sites of CSF absorption. But this is again a hypothesis which has not been definitively proved. Absorption of CSF across brain tissue into the capillaries also has been proposed. Again, this is another proposition. So still arachnoid granulations are the main, are believed to be the main source of CSF egress from the uh, brain into the venous system. So what are the causes of hydrocephalus? During neonatal to late infancy period, you can classify them uh, according to the age group. So below two years and above two years is what we generally classify in pediatric neurological disorders. Less than two years, hydrocephalus is usually caused by hemorrhage and meningitis. These are most common causes apart from the developmental abnormalities such as the congenital malformations. So the most common anomaly would be aqueductal stenosis. In late childhood, early to late childhood, that is 2 to 10 years of age, the most common cause of hydrocephalus are post reforcer tumors. And also aqueductal stenosis, which when mild can present a little later. The causes of hydrocephalus can be, these are the broad classification according to the age group, but when you have to etiologically classify them, you classify as malformations, infections, vascular causes, tumors, trauma, and syndromes associated with hydrocephalus. Let us discuss each of them in detail now. So, among the congenital malformations, agenesis of corpus callosum, Arnold Curie malformation, aqueductal stenosis, and Dandy Walker malformation are the four important malformations. Other than that, it can be seen with in association with a lot of other malformations that are listed. Among infections, congenital syphilis, cytomegalic inclusion disease, mumps, post meningitis, that is post bacterial meningitis, 
and post encephalitis due to any viral encephalitis and toxoplasmosis is an important cause of hydrocephalus congenital syphilis is very rarely seen and uh, cytomegalic inclusion disease again is not very commonly seen but there are certain uh, viruses which uh, are very prone to develop hydrocephalus one of those is mumps and you should always remember toxoplasmosis is a congenital infection which commonly causes hydrocephalus among the neoplasms generally in the acquired uh, after 2 years acquired causes brain stem glioma cerebellar tumors including astrocytoma which is the most common cerebellar tumor and choroid plexus tumors which increase csf production rather than cause obstruction and colloid cyst of the third ventricle though it is not a very common cause it is an important and a benign cause and a very readily treatable cause you have a whole list of tumors posterior fossa tumors especially including ependymoma medulloblastoma and uh, langerhans cell histiocytosis can present as a mass causing hydrocephalus and you have the common liquid tumors including leukemia which can uh, result in hydrocephalus due to infiltration that is you call that leptomeningeal uh, uh, spread of the tumor so traumatic causes should always be remembered hemorrhages across age groups be it preterm related or be it post neonatal age group trauma related hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy again more common in the neonatal age group can be present in any age group as an acquired cause and posterior fossa surgery can lead to gliosis and secondary hydrocephalus the vascular causes should not be forgotten vein of gallen malformation is an important Uh, congenital malformation in children with presence of hydrocephalus and also distended veins in the forehead and scalp which can give a clue any other arterial large enough arterial venous malformation or venous sinus thrombosis can lead to hydrocephalus one should not forget syndromes so there are a lot of syndromes the most important which i would ask you to remember is mucopolysaccharidosis the craniosynostosis or craniostenosis syndromes including apert and cruzen syndrome and uh, osteopetrosis though it is not a very common cause it is an important cause and uh, you one should identify this early for treatment so other causes include klippel trenaune weber syndrome walker warburg syndrome and muscle eye brain disease so these two diseases walker warburg and muscle eye brain disease are Uh, peripheral nervous system diseases that are they, they present as congenital muscular dystrophies which also has cns involvement in the form of hydrocephalus and malformations of cortical and cerebellar development so on and so forth so neurofibromatosis again can be associated with hydrocephalus and achondroplasia is again associated with hydrocephalus these two are relatively common disorders which can be remembered so coming to the discussion of congenital causes so approximately 55% of all cases of hydrocephalus are congenital primary acutaneous stenosis as i told you already accounts for 5% of congenital hydrocephalus whereas acutaneous stenosis secondary to neoplasm that is secondary acutaneous stenosis it could be due to neoplasm infection or hemorrhage accounts for another 5% because it is a narrow region uh, even hemorrhagic residue or gliosis due to infection or trauma can lead to secondary acutaneous stenosis uh, in this region and lead to hydrocephalus So there is an X-linked hydrocephalus syndrome called the Bicker-Adams syndrome, which is prevalent in males because it is an X-linked recessive disorder. It is characterized by stenosis of the aqueduct of Sylvius and severe intellectual disability. And there is a characteristic deformity of the thumb called the adduction flexion deformity of the thumb. So it is present in half of individuals. So this is called the Bicker-Adams syndrome. this has a genetic basis which i'll discuss a little later secondary acutaneous stenosis caused by gliosis as i told you secondary to infection or hemorrhage so anatomical malformations frequently observed with idiopathic congenital hydrocephalus are associated with the abnormalities of hind brain development that is the posterior fossa development including chiari malformations and dandy walker malformations which are two important malformations which i had already told you Dandy Walker is associated with atresia of the foramen of Lushka and Majendi and affects 2 to 4% of newborns with hydrocephalus. About 50% of patients with Dandy Walker malformation develop hydrocephalus. The dilated fourth ventricle does not communicate effectively with the subarachnoid space. So if you can see this MRI of these patients the fourth ventricle is dilated. So one would wonder why a dilated fourth ventricle would cause obstruction. The thing is that 
the dilated fourth ventricle does not communicate with the subarachnoid space. So they have uh, that atresia of the foramina which exit the fourth ventricle and that is why they develop hydrocephalus. So this atresia is responsible for the hydrocephalus. In patients with Chiari malformations, hydrocephalus may occur with fourth ventricle outlet obstruction in Chiari type 1. It is commonly associated with meningomyelocele in Chiari type 2. So as the number increases, the lethality of the malformation increases, what you know. So in type 1, you don't have a meningomyelocele, but in type 2, you have a lumbar meningomyelocele. In type 3, you would have a occipital encephalocele. And uh, the type 4 is lethal. It is not compatible with life in the postnatal period. So hydrocephalus occurs in approximately 80 to 90% of patients with meningomyelocele. So whenever you see a patient with meningomyelocele, you should always look up and screen the brain for hydrocephalus. You may need to operate the patient later on after for hydrocephalus as well. Only 50% are obvious at birth. So the rest, 40 to 50%, you will get to know only with time. Neonatal hydrocephalus also can be a part of a major cerebral malformation such as an encephalocele or holoprosencephaly or can be associated with an in inherited inborn error of metabolism such as Hurler disease that is mucopolysaccharidosis or achondroplasia. Other causes of congenital hydrocephalus include agenesis of the foramen of Monroe as an isolated rare but uh, isolated malformation, um, congenital tumors, arachnoid cysts, Vascular malformations, including vein of gallon malformation, intrauterine toxoplasma. So these are all, this is just putting all these causes as a congenital cause. So you should remember that congenital doesn't mean genetic. So these are all present since birth. So intrauterine toxoplasmosis is an infection which is acquired in the antenatal period and present since birth. Hence, it is a congenital cause rather than an acquired cause. So what are the acquired causes? Most are infective or post-hemorrhagic. So, infective causes of hydrocephalus include meningitis, especially bacterial, which can lead to a lot of scarring due to exudate resolution and all that. This leads to hydrocephalus by inflammation. In some geographical areas, parasitic disease such as intraventricular cysticercosis, especially in the region of the third and fourth ventricle, can cause hydrocephalus by mechanical obstruction. Post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus occurs after IVH and it is very commonly seen in the premature infants, younger the infant or more premature the infant, higher the possibility of a post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus or IV, severe IVH. It can also be seen after head injury or rupture of a vascular malformation inside the ventricle. Hydrocephalus after IVH is usually ascribed to a process called fibrosing arachnoiditis or meningeal fibrosis and gliosis of the subependymal sub cells which impair flow and resorption of the CSF. One third of ELBW patients with an high with a high intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, develop post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. So not all patients with IVH develop post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Those with a higher grade develop hydrocephalus, and those with a lesser weight develop hydrocephalus more commonly. And not every one of these patients will require shunting. Only fifteen percent will require shunting. The others will not have uh, symptoms of raised pressure, and the hydrocephalus will stabilize with time. Something which we call arrested hydrocephalus, which will be discussed a little later. So another group of acquired lesions are mass lesions, which account for 20% of hydrocephalus in children, particularly in a bigger uh, child which, who has crossed the neonatal age. They are usually tumors such as medulloblastoma, astrocytoma, ependymoma. These are all posterior fossa tumors. But cysts, abscesses, vascular malformations, and hematomas can also be the cause. Approximately 20% of children develop hydrocephalus requiring shunting after posterior fossa tumor removal. This may be delayed even up to a year. They may not develop hydrocephalus immediately. Even after resection of the surgery and radiotherapy, they can develop hydrocephalus. Increased venous sinus pressure can also lead to hydrocephalus. One example and the most important example would be venous sinus thrombosis. And there are some iatrogenic causes including hypervitaminosis A, which can lead to hydrocephalus by increasing secretion of CSF or by increasing permeability of the blood-brain barrier. It is important to note that high vitamin uh, A dosage can also lead to condition called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So true hydrocephalus can also be caused by this condition. What are the clinical features of hydrocephalus? So it depends on the age of the child and the acuity of presentation. Right. So if it's going to be present uh, in very smaller infants and it's going to be uh, present in uh, a, a bigger infant, the symptoms after closure of the cranial sutures, the symptoms are going to vary. In infants, 
because of the relative distensibility of the infantile skull, the presentation will be more subtle with symptoms of failure to thrive or delayed development. So poor feeding and vomiting are important symptoms. These children may have apneic spells, episodes of bradycardia, and a bulging tense anterior fontanel. Head circumference increases abnormally across centiles. Scalp veins may get distended, scalp skin thin and shiny, cranial sutures are split. So this is not a picture which is not uncommonly seen. So uh, in advanced cases, clinical examination reveals a significant craniofacial disproportion, which expansion of the dome of the cranial vault and low set ears and eyes. So percussion of the skull may uh, produce a cracked pot resonance or a cracked pot percussion note called the McEwen sign. In very severe cases, when the cortex is thinned out, transillumination may be positive. Seizures are rarely seen as a result of hydrocephalus alone. Seizures are not very common. After a shunt, you can get seizures if the shunt is infected, if there is a meningoencephalitis after that, or just because of the mechanical effect of the shunt. But seizures alone are not the usual complication of hydrocephalus. So in this age group, because the sutures can be uh, spread out and anterior fontanelle is not closed, papilledema is rare, but fundoscopy, that is uh, fundus examination by uh, direct ophthalmoscopy can lead to uh, disclosure of retinal venous engorgement in many patients. So there is something called sunsetting, which is commonly seen. The mechanism is due to pressure of the third ventricle on the midbrain tectum. So the midbrain tectum is where the upgaze center is situated. The gaze center for upward vertical gaze is situated. So this results in upgaze palsy because of compression of this upgaze center in the midbrain tectum by the third ventricle. So this uh, is through the suprapineal recess. This is a CSF recess just above the tectum of the midbrain. So because of this, the child cannot look up Hence, the child has a sunsetting appearance of the face. In infants over the age of six months, limb tone may be increased with spasticity, preferentially affecting the lower limbs. So this is because the lower limb fibers are more medially arranged. So when the lateral ventricle is dilated, that those are the fibers that are going to be get compressed and edematous. Some infants with definite hydrocephalus exhibit no such signs as hydrocephalus may have developed slowly and splaying of the sutures may have prevented the intracranial pressure from increasing. So some infants with hydrocephalus after IVH may show hypotonia. So that is also possible, especially axial, also appendicular, but usually some spasticity sets in with time in these patients. More than two years, because head circumference is going to be within the normal limits because the sutures have closed and anterior fontanel is not open, you cannot have macrocephaly in these patients. So they present with behavioral problems, they are present with spasticity and motor problems. So learning problems, reduced intellectual function, regression can be common. This is one of the causes of pseudo-regression or a correctable cause of neuroregression. And deteriorating school performance as a result of headaches, failing mental function, memory loss and behavioral disturbances. Headaches are very important in this because the child's head cannot expand. There is going to be progressive increase in the intercranial pressure. So the midbrain syndrome, the full-blown midbrain syndrome is called the Perinard syndrome. So in addition to this upgaze palsy, you can have the other signs of this midbrain syndrome. That is light near dissociation of the pupil, convergence retraction nystagmus, uh, which is called the Duane's nystagmus, and uh, eyelid retraction sign, which is called the Collier sign. So these are all typical neurological signs which can be seen in older children and adults. Because of the same principle, the suprapineal recess is going to compress on the midbrain and cause this midbrain syndrome or the dorsal midbrain syndrome as this paranoid syndrome is also called. So abnormal hypothalamic functions, that is endocrine dysfunction due to short stature, gigantism, obesity, delayed puberty, primary amenorrhea, menstrual irregularity and diabetes incipitus may occur secondary to increase in tracheal pressure or dilation of the third ventricle. Difficulty in walking, secondary to truncal and limb attacks and limb spasticity are important presentations. This affects the lower limbs, as I told you previously, because the periventricular pyramidal tracts are stretched by the enlarged ventricles. Neck pain is a very ominous sign. It means there is isolated, there is associated uh, tonsillar herniation, 
blurred vision can be present as a consequence of papilledema which when untreated may cause optic atrophy so having discussed the presentation and the causes of hydrocephalus let's discuss about the genetics of hydrocephalus we know that many patients with hydrocephalus without a known cause may fit into a syndromic or a non syndromic genetic etiology so there are nine such genes which have been isolated with hydrocephalus which has been identified in animal models whereas only one such gene has been identified in humans which i had already addressed to a little before so this is called x linked hydrocephalus hsas 1 is the uh, is the particular syndrome which occurs approximately in 5 to 15% of congenital cases in which genetic etiology is determined it's a very small number but this is only identified gene which has a locus in xq28 encoding for l1cam that is a l1 cell addition molecule so l1 cam belongs to the immunoglobulin subfamily of neural cell addition molecules that is expressed in neurons and schwann cells so this is the bicker adam syndrome which is talking about so this has a presentation with hydrocephalus in boys with stenosis of the aqueduct of stilvius uh there is spastic paraparesis and there is a this is a spectrum of disorder that is it can present with hydrocephalus it can present with spastic paraparesis it can present with just agenesis of corpus corpus callosum or it can be present with a syndrome called a massa syndrome that is mental retardation aphasia shuffling gait and adducted thumbs so this is the the uh um, thumb deformity is quite characteristic this adduction flexion deformity of the thumb so this is to be when it is present in boys with hydrocephalus you would think of l1 cam associated x linked hydrocephalus so these separately named conditions have been thankfully for us been combined into the acronym crash standing for corpus callosum agenesis retardation that is mental retardation and intellectual disability adducted thumbs shuffling gait and hydrocephalus so this can be easily remembered so how do you diagnose hydrocephalus so let's discuss the neuroimaging in hydrocephalus so ultrasound is the generally the first investigation in infants and neonates so in the presence of an open anterior fontanel neonates in infants transfontanel or ultrasound is the quickest least expensive and most convenient method ultrasound is useful for the diagnosis of intrauterine hydrocephalus and communicating and non communicating post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus so the ventricular width is measured it is measured from the midline to the lateral border of the lateral ventricle in the mid coronal view which is a measurement which is has a very least inter observer variability hence this is the uh, statistic which is used to compare between patients as well as with serially in one patient when you follow them up so the limitations are that it requires operator experience and often cannot establish a clear cause of the hydrocephalus and the posterior fossa structures are not very clearly you know elucidated with the ultrasound ct is a is a better modality it demonstrates ventricular size morphology and the presence of periventricular lucencies can reveal underlying pathologies to a certain extent such as hemorrhage and posterior fossa tumors and it is also useful uh, in a very quick uh, setup where it is uh, required on an emergency basis and you can do serial imaging and follow up post op but there is exposure to radiation particularly with serial imaging and the fact that it may not always reveal the cause of hydrocephalus as i told you the posterior fossa the third ventricle the aqueduct are all very uh, narrow areas where a ct does not have uh, enough resolution to identify the cause so that is why we use an mri mri provides better morphologic definition and etiologic diagnosis such as the presence of low grade gliomas or colloid cyst of third ventricle which can be very small and it can also help you identify what kind of a glioma you are dealing dealing with because based on the radiological signatures so this may not be demonstrable on ct so it is also better for evaluating posterior fossa malformations including carry malformations or a cerebellar or periaqueductal tumors again because of the spatial resolution it offers it also offers better imaging of the posterior fossa as i told you and there is a an mri technique called the cini mri where the csf flow is studied to measure the stroke volume within the cerebral aqueduct so there is a limitation as well that children require general anesthesia for the mri to be acquired and one important thing which you see in practice is that after an mri the programmable shunt valves require reprogramming this has to be you know told to the neurosurgeon you cannot just do off an mri 
and then send the child home, the shunt valves need to be reprogrammed or the shunt wouldn't function as effectively. So, so with this imaging modalities, you will be able to diagnose hydrocephalus. That's not a problem. So uh, you will have to look for certain things. So anatomical ventriculomegaly is not sufficient to diagnose hydrocephalus. As I told you, ventriculomegaly does not equal hydrocephalus. When diagnosing hydrocephalus in neonates or infants, it is essential to establish that there is a truly abnormal rate of skull growth. So enlarged head size, again, does not equal hydrocephalus. Enlarged ventricle size is also not hydrocephalus. So one should see that their head circumference increases or it is increased to more than two standard deviations and there is it is disproportionate to the body length or weight. So many children may not have a head circumference more than two standard deviation or you may not wait until that, but it is disproportionate to the child's trajectory before the visit, index visit, or it is disproportionate to the body's length or weight. And when you uh, do a serial growth monitoring, there is accelerated growth crossing centile curves or for an absolute value, it crosses more than 1.25 centimeter per week, which is grossly abnormal. So evaluation should always include a history of trauma or sinus infection or a preterm or a neonatal history, which can most likely you know, tell you the diagnosis. That is a cause of hydrocephalus. The family history, you should ask for this X-linked hydrocephalus. And you should always examine the parent's head circumference when you evaluate a child with microcephaly. It need not be hydrocephalus. It could be benign famil familial microcephaly. No obvious explanation can be determined that the possibility of an intrauterine infection should be investigated. You often have MRI and CT clues in the form of calcifications and uh, certain other malformations in the case of CMV or toxoplasmosis. Coagulation factor deficiencies as well as thrombocytopenia should be excluded because if you do not have IVH due to uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage in a preterm or even a term where it is a very uncommon, you should exclude other causes including something called NEAT that is neonatal aluimmune, sorry, isoimmune thrombocytopenia and coagulation factor 5 deficiency which can and is known to present as with congenital hydrocephalus due to an antenatal or a postnatal bleed. So coming to the differential diagnosis of a large head, not just hydrocephalus, you know hydrocephalus and its classification now, but you should also think of other causes outside the ventricle. So one is a subdural fluid, which can cause a large head. Subdural fluid can be due to a post-traumatic hematoma. It can be due to a post-meningitis, uh, subdural hygroma or an empyema. It could be the benign, benign extra external hydrocephalus or benign enlargement of the subarachnoid space, which I had discussed first before starting the discussion of hydrocephalus. It could be a true enlargement of the brain itself. So this is called megalencephaly. This can be subclassified as anatomic and metabolic. So anatomic megalencephaly, the causes or examples are tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis, fragile X syndrome, cerebral jejantism, that is Soto syndrome, where it, this is a genetic uh, enlargement of the brain. If the enlargement of the individual neurons are due to accumulation of metabolic substrates, then that means that it is a metabolic cause of megalencephaly. Eminent examples of this subclassification is mycopolysaccharidosis, gangliosidosis, including tay sachs disease, Alexander disease, Kahneman disease, which are leukodystrophies, and glutaric aciduria type 1. Abnormal skull growth can also lead to a large head. So a very common example of this particular cause is achondroplasia. Familial micro microcephaly is one cause of benign head enlargement. So it is very evident after you measure the head circumference of a sibling or a parents. So what are the differential diagnosis? One rare but striking condition that can mimic hydrocephalus is hydrenencephaly, which is a post neurulation defect that results in total or near total absence of cerebral tissue with the intracranial cavity being filled with CSF instead. So it is caused by bilateral internal carotid artery infarction due to a congenital infection or a thrombotic complication antenatally or because of extensive CNS infection which leads to liquefaction of the brain. So it's only fluid inside. There is no brain or very rudimentary parts of the brain are preserved. So one another cause which I already alluded to is hydrocephalus ex vacuo, which is ventriculomegaly due to atrophy rather than CSF problems. 
And third, as I'd already told you, there may be a family history of large hits in these instances. There is often no increase in intracranial pressure or developmental abnormality. Child is developmentally normal and the child doesn't have any abnormal signs on neurological examination. Both the ventricles and the brain are larger than normal, but they are normal for them. It may not be normal for us, but this is a benign condition. So not all large heads have hydrocephalus. How do you manage hydrocephalus? So when the hydrocephalus is symptomatic, we should offer treatment to patients. So it is generally clear when patients need treatment and the treatment is often surgical. So the decision to treat these patients with a CSF diversion procedure generally is not very confusing. But not all patients with enlarged ventricles require treatment. Right? So in patients with obstructive hydrocephalus secondary to a mass that is a posterior fossa mass for an example, if the mass is surgically accessible and complete resection is possible, then the hydrocephalus may not need treatment after the CNS di uh, flow dynamics have been re-established. Obviously, they may require shunt treatment later, but not all patients require shunt treatment immediately. If there is no documented obstruction or operable lesion is present and the hydrocephalus is mild and slowly progressive, so you may give a trial period of observation or medical management may be indicated, especially in preterm infants. Another situation where we do not go for surgery immediately is when there is arrested hydrocephalus, when the head is large, there is ventricular megaly, but there are no signs of raised pressure and there is no, there are no imaging signs of raised, uh, there is an altered series of dynamics right at this point because there is no periventricular ooze as seen on the MRI or the CT. So this is it's said to be uncommon in textbooks, but in practice, we see many of these children with a largish appearing head, chronic arrested hydrocephalus, where these patients' CSF pressure has returned to normal and there is a new gradient at which the CSF drains. And there is no pressure uh, problems between the cerebral ventricles and the brain parenchyma. That is, there is no ooze or uh, brain dysfunction. So these patients can be followed carefully with serial neurological examinations and neuropsychological assessments and careful assessment of the development. Most of these patients may not need surgery. So what are the types of surgical options you can offer these patients? Depending on the specific patients, any of these procedures can be performed. You know, there's a ventricular tap which can be done in infants through the anterior fontanel. There is an external ventricular drainage which can be done. There is a tube is placed which drains the ventricle outside. And there is an internal drainage procedure, which is called ventricular peritoneal shunt. There are other kinds of shunts also we'll discuss here. And you can do serial lumbar punctures in post-hemorrhagic and post-meningetic hydrocephalus. If the patient is not surgically, you know, a candidate or it is, uh, the child is sick enough for surgery. So shunt is a procedure to establish a communication between the CSF. The CSF could be ventricular or lumbar CSF and a drainage site such as a peritoneal pleural cavity. So the most common shunt is a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. So it's the most accepted procedure. The advantage is that previously shunts used to be placed uh, inside the atrium through the jugular vein to the atrium or into the peritoneal cavity, sorry, pleural cavity uh, very rarely. But as the child grows, you may need to lengthen the shunt, but that problem is not there in ventricular peritoneal shunt because the peritoneum can accommodate a longer length of the catheter. So you can use a long catheter in these patients. In patients with contraindications of ventricular peritoneal shunting, if the child at that time has peritonitis or peritoneal adhesions after previous abdominal surgery, you can do a ventricular pleural or a ventricular atrial shunts, but they have their own complications. So these days we use programmable shunts, that is shunts with programmable valves, which are an alternative system, which allow multiple pressure settings to adjust the valve for over under drainage, avoiding a shunt revision. So depending on the CSF dynamics, that is the cause of hydrocephalus, whether it's a long-standing hydrocephalus, whether it's an acute hydrocephalus, whether it's hydrocephalus due to a mass obstruction or it is just due to a post-hemorrhagic or a post-meningeal uh, meningitic cause, the surgeon generally chooses a uh, high pressure, medium pressure or a low pressure valve, which is then uh, placed inside the ventricle. 
So endoscopic third ventriculostomy is a surgical procedure. It's an endoscopic procedure which does not leave a shunt inside. It creates an outlet in the floor of the third ventricle. So endoscopic third ventriculostomy is particularly useful in patients with congenital aqueductal stenosis. So the ventricles do not decrease in size to the degree they do with a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Basically, what is done is that the third ventricle is fenestrated and because there is an obstruction of drainage of CSF from the third to fourth ventricle, they, these patients after the surgery, because of the fenestration, they drain through that particular orifice. So ventricular size does not decrease to a certain, uh, the degree to which they do in the ventricular peritoneal shunt. So you may not uh, determine the function of a ventriculostomy, whether the ventriculostomy is working or not by neuroimaging. You know that after a ventricular peritoneal shunt, we do serial neuroimaging with a CT or an MRI to see whether the ventricular size has come down, but that may not be possible very effectively in this after the surgery. There are complications specific to the surgery as well because it uh, the operating site is close to the hypothalamus and fornix. There can be injury. Cranial nerves can be injured and there may be perforation of a basal, a basal artery, which is a life-threatening and a dreaded complication for a neurosurgeon. So there is a rare, but initially it was unrecognized that there is can be a late rapid deterioration. What happens is that patients suddenly, when they previously have been doing well after the surgery, suddenly complain of headache and rapidly deteriorate. The mechanism is unclear. Probably the, the fenestration created gets blocked. So without immediate access to neurosurgery, they need immediate shunting or any other kind of CSF drainage or diversion. They quickly lapse into unconsciousness and they cone and die due to closure of this ventriculostomy. So this is a very dreaded complication. This should uh, never occur. This is not a very common complication, but it, it, it is well documented. So always we look for non-surgical options, particularly in patients who are not, uh, who do not have you know, very se severe uh, symptomatic hydrocephalus or in patients who do not, uh, are not surgical candidates because of their poor general condition. So this is commonly seen in very small preterm infants with intraventricular hemorrhage. So in these patients, as I'd already shown you certain numbers, the course of the ventricular dilation is variable. Patients may demonstrate an arrest or reduction in ventricular megaly with even no treatment. So shunting of these patients may be unnecessary and may be hazardous as well. So complications of shunting again is, is associated with this because there you are going to place a lifelong shunt. So you can have a collapsed cortical mantle because these patients, the brain is very fragile in these patients and there can be subdural hemorrhage. There can be marked cerebral conformational changes, intraparenchymal hemorrhage secondary to the sudden decompression. Or there can be hardware erosion through the skin in very preterm infants, again because the skin is very fragile. And of course, there is a risk of infection, which can complicate the picture in these already frail infants. So people have used astazolamide and furosemide as a combination or astazolamide isolated, but evidence does not support this use. We have large randomized control trials which show that there is no benefit with diuretics. So there is also a very bad news in this that the primary secondary outcome measure of death in the first year of life or neurodevelopment disability was higher in these infants uh, receiving diuretic therapy. Hence, it has been largely abandoned. In addition, you can have renal complications such as nephrocalcinosis in a small group. Repeated lumbar punctures, serial lumbar punctures to remove a small quantity of CSS is a common method of attempting to prevent ventricular dilation after IVH. This is commonly done in neonatal ICUs because of the child may not, may be too small for a surgery and you may need to decompress a certain amount. And with the uh, hypothesis that removal of the CSF containing blood and protein, which may later lead to blockage, can be avoided. So again, we have evidence now showing that none of these trials which included these procedures showed that there is a decreased need of shunting. So... Rather, again, this also has given the bad news that there is a higher incidence of CNSF infection because you're going to poke the child again and again uh, through a lumbar puncture. And intraventricular fibrinolytic agents to prevent the development of hydrocephalus after IVH also has been studied and these have largely been discarded because of ineffectivity. So Cochrane interview of this topic finally concluded the CSF tapping is not helpful. 
it cannot be recommended but you can consider it one time or a limited number of times for symptomatic raised intracranial pressure which is still done in NICUs. Other options with rapidly progressive ventricular megaly who are too small for the shunt include an extra ventricular drain or a subgallial ventricular reservoir called the Omaya reservoir or a subgallial shunt. So these, uh, these devices are temporizing measures which can be used until the infant is large enough for permanent shunt placement. In addition, 25% of these patients, these devices have arrest of hydrosome, as I told you. So they just require removal of this temporary reservoir and they may need not require permanent shunt placement. What are the complications? The overall failure rate of shunt is 50, 40, 40, 40% in the first year of replacement is a huge number. It can be due to obstruction, it can be due to infection, it can be due to mechanical failure, it can be due to you know, over drainage, loculated ventricles and abdominal complications. So in neonate shunt man ma malfunction, presence as feeding abnormalities, irritability, lethargy, fever, somnolence and a bulging fontanel. Older children may present with headache, vomiting and meningismus. Shunt infection need not have fever. That is important. They can present just with malfunction because these organisms are very low virulence organisms, including coagulase negative, staphylococci and all other skin common cells which just uh, form a film over these uh, inside these shunts or over these shunts and cause shunt dysfunction and they do not mount a, a lot of an inflammatory response and fever. So with VP shunts, when the peritoneum is also inflamed, you can get abdominal pain as a focus of uh, abdominal infection in the peritoneum. So as I told you, staph epidermidis and staph aureus are the most common cause of shunt-related infection. Usually shunt-related infections occur within three months. Whenever infection is suspected, you should always draw blood and CSF specimens for culture. Shunts can also be tapped to obtain CSF specimens, but... Surgeons do not prefer that which, because it may alter the um, uh, shunt dynamic mechanism. But people do continue doing it because the easy way of subcutaneously getting a CSF sample instead of doing a lumbar puncture. So if the infection leads to impairment, if there is infection and shunt malfunction, then removal and replacement is generally required. You can temporarily insert an external ventriculostomy until the infection is controlled. And then after four to six weeks or even eight weeks, a new shunt is placed. Other complications include, as I told you, the lower end can get infected, leading to peritonitis, ascites, intra-abdominal cysts, intracranial granulomas, gastrointestinal obstruction, migration within the peritoneal cavity, headache, and perforation of abdominal viscera. It can also be excluded through the anus. Abdominal pseudosis, again, is not an uncommon complication of uh, a ventricular peritoneal shunt, which is in situ. It can present with nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension and pain, abdominal ultrasonography, readily demonstrates these. So correction of long-standing hydrocephalus with a very low pressure valve can result in subdural hematomas due to sudden decompression leading to shrinking of the brain and then the subdural uh, bridging veins are ruptured and then cause hematomas. So this is an important complication. The slit ventricle syndrome it is defined as a severe uh, the presentation is defined as that with severe life-modifying headaches in patients with shunts for the treatment of hydrocephalus. And the ventricle is generally small, slit-like. So the pathophysiology may vary. So, uh, pathophysiology, one pathophysiology is that there is severe intracranial hypotension. Just like after a CSF, uh, lumbar CSF, there is low pressure headache. Lumbar CS of drainage due to lumbar puncture. Similar to that, intracranial hypotension is one pathophysiology. There can be intermittent obstruction of the ventricular catheter, which can lead to the slit ventricular syndrome. Sometimes it drains too much, sometimes it doesn't drain. Intracranial hypertension with small ventricles and a failed shunt. This is this the shunt dynamics changes into a normal volume hydrocephalus. So this is another uh, potential pathophysiology. Intracranial hypertension with the working shunt is called cephalocranial hypertension. This has not been, uh, this is not very clear as to what this is, but this again is one of the proposed pathophysiology. And shunt related migraine is another important cause. Shunt can precipitate migraine in patients who are genetically determined. So this can lead to just a migraine, which has to be treated like migraine, but it is triggered or the migraine starts after the shunt placement. So the pathophysiology may vary. But if you have a patient with severe headaches and you see that the ventricles are not enlarged, the ventricles are enlarged, you mean that the shunt is not draining and that is 
because the shunt is not working and that is causing the head headache but if that is not the case the ventricles are normal or slit like then you could think of these possibilities so when the over drainage is the cause of this neurological presentation you manage them with valve upgrades and addition of devices that re retard siphoning so you put a uh, high pressure valve instead of a low pressure valve the other manage management options are you can do a subtemporal decompression calvarial expansion or shunting devices that access the cortical uh, subarachnoid space mm -hmm. such as lumboperitoneal shunts or shunts involving a cisterna magna so this is how just to equalize the pressure because you know the brain matter is between the subarachnoid space and the ventri and the csf inside and the ventricles with its csf so you are going to drain only the ventricles there is going to be a pressure mismatch and there is going to be over drainage when you have a shunt in the other uh, csf space that is the subarachnoid space cortical subarachnoid space then this can be circumvented. So this is the logic behind this particular procedure for over drainage. So what is the prognosis? Shunt dependence carries a 1% year per year mortality. There is a series of 900 odd patients who reported a mortality to 12% to 10 years from the time of initial shunt placement. The main risk factor for death is a shunt infection. So most children require multiple shunt revisions due to mechanical complications or shunt infections. It is greater in patients with meningomyelosis than other etiologies because of a higher predisposition for infection. So the neurological and intellectual disability among patients with hydrocephalus depend on many factors. The etiology and degree of hydrocephalus, the thickness of the cortical mantle and corpus callosum, the requirement of a shunt, and presence of other brain anomalies associated to conditions such as IVH, CNS infection, and hypoxia. So the overall brain functioning is more important than just the presence of hydrocephalus for prognosticating these children. Behavioral problems are more common in children with hydrocephalus irrespective of etiology, probably because of the diffuse white matter injury. And epilepsy is also more prevalent with hydrocephalus. A brief discussion on arachnoid cysts before we conclude, because this also comes under this heading. So intracranial arachnoid cysts are benign, non-genetic developmental cysts that contain spiny fluid and occur within the arachnoid membrane. So these cysts occur in proximity to arachnoid cisterns, most often in the sylvian fissure. This is a very common site where you see an arachnoid cyst. Generally, they are asymptomatic. Common neurological features may include headache, seizures, hydrocephalus, focal enlargement of the skull, and signs and symptoms of elevated pressure and development delay in certain patients. When the cyst is supracellular, this can produce neuroendocrine dysfunction because of hypothalamic compression, hydrocephalus because of uh, compression of the third ventricle, or an optic nerve compression because of the compression of the optic nerve and the chiasma. So progressive enlargement of this cyst and intracystic or subdural hemorrhage are the complications. This is not very common, but this can still occur. So as I told you, Sylvian fissure contains 50% of the cysts. It can also be present in the cerebellopontine angle in the posterior fossa. In the quadrigeminal cistern, it can be present. And in the supracellular cellular area where it causes all these endocrine syndromes, the interhemispheric fissure and the cerebral convexity are very rare areas where it can be present. So a sylvian fissure or a middle cranial fossa uh, arachnoid cyst is what is depicted in this figure. So this figure shows that there is a temporal region arachnoid cyst which is causing some compression or flattening of these gyri. So two-thirds of pediatric arachnoid cysts are located in this particular location, in the middle cranial fossa. They may increase in volume, opening, opening this fissure and exposing the uh, middle cerebral artery. This exposure may lead to compression and undevelopment of the anterior superior surface of the temporal lobe. Headaches are the most common presenting symptoms, but you can have proptosis, contralateral motor weakness, and seizures. 10% of children developmental delay can be present. There is this very controversial this statement, but there are some studies which show that there are there is uh, documented cognitive improvement after surgical treatment in patients, especially with developmental delay, and this big arachnoid cyst in this middle cranial fossa, but uh, large numbers have to demonstrate this later. So children who have bitemporal arachnoid cysts should be evaluated for the possibility of a metabolic disorder, which is treatable, glutaric asteria type 1. Bitemporal arachnoid cysts have also been reported in patients with neurofibromatosis. So this is a posterior fossa arachnoid cyst, which can be seen, a large posterior fossa arachnoid cyst 
compressing uh, the cerebellum more on the right than the left. So posterior fossa are uncommon, must be differentiated from other cystic malformations, including the Dandy Walker malformation. There are multiple variants. It's been put into a spectrum disorder now, Dandy Walker spectrum. Macrocephaly and intracranial pressure are frequently observed because the posterior fossa is narrow. Cerebellar cysts demonstrate nystagmus and other cerebellar signs. Other rare manifestations include cervical spinal cord compression, which may improve after posterior fossa cystoperitoneal shunting and endoscopic surgery. In these patients, gait disturbance and headache are commonly seen. Posterior fossa cysts can be large and can also be familial. So these are very highly likely to produce symptoms as compared to the supratentorial cysts, that is the sylvian fissure cysts. Uh, it is controversial whether these the previously described sylvian fissures is really cause symptoms or not, but a posterior fossa cyst can be believed to cause symptoms. Again, this is a cellular uh, cyst, arachnoid cyst. Again, as I told you, because of the location, they cause certain location-specific symptoms. They can cause third ventricle obstruction, hydrocephalus, and visual impairment in endocrine function. There is something called the bobble head doll syndrome with involuntary head movement secondary to intracranial pressure on the third ventricle. So whenever you have this midline uh, bobble head doll kind of a movement, you should screen patients for a cellular mass or a cellular sub uh, arachnoid cyst as in this case. So because of compression on the dorsal medial thalamic nuclei, this kind of uh, head and eye movements are present. Endoscopic surgical approaches are preferred because of the location. It is accessible and it causes minimal, causes minimal invasion. So the complication of the arachnoid cysts, it is very controversial when someone attributes any symptom to presence of an arachnoid cyst, particularly headaches or seizures for that matter. Hence, the decision to operate is very difficult. It should be made on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. Surgery is indicated straightforward when the shunt is causing obstructive hydrocephalus or neuroimaging demonstrates a mass effect with compression of a normal brain or brain stem or any midline structure. The relationship between symptoms such as ADHD, aphasia, migraine-like headaches is very uncertain. If you operate them, the cyst may go away, but the headache may not. So correlation between cyst location and specific symptoms or congruent EEG findings is necessary. It is a very a difficult decision to operate such patients without a clear uh, causative link between the cyst and the particular symptom. And you should discuss this before surgery. So some epilepsy, some patients have uh, documented seizure reduction after arachnoid cysts. Again, it's very controversial. The relationship between the presence of arachnoid cysts and occurrence of seizures when the intracranial pressure is normal is uncertain. However, when the... Uh, and outcomes, whether these patients are managed medically or surgically are similar. So if it's going to be surgically refractory, then you should think whether you need to really operate this arachnoid cyst. And again, you need convergence of evidence. That is concordance between interictal and ictal EEG and the clinical semiology of seizures. Only then you will decide on operating these patients. Subdural hygroma can be a rare complication because of trauma. There is a bleeding inside this arachnoid cyst. So this particularly prone in the cyst, which I've shown previously, that the middle cranial fossa cyst, because of the presence of the middle meningeal artery around that area. So minor trauma can be a precipitating factor. So this can be present in 2.4% of patients with chronic subdural hematomas or hygroma. So only when you study their MRIs carefully, you can see that they have bled into a subarachnoid, uh, sorry, uh, they have bled into an arachnoid cyst. Neuropsychiatric disorders, ADHD, as I told previously in the previous few slides, speech delay, development delay have been found in association, but clearly there is no causative relationship, especially in the temporal lobe, because many behavioral problems originate from the temporal lobe. Mental impairment and development delay have been associated with large arachnoid cysts, and the presence of cysts and developmental delay may be a part of a common developmental process. So it can just be a bystander or just telling that there is a developmental problem, but that may not be due to the cyst proper. So again, certain surgeons have claimed through uh, studies in literature that there are improvements after surgical treatment in cognition in these patients. There is an increase in arachnoid cyst incidence in conditions such as Down syndrome, mucopolysaccharidosis, and neurofibromatosis. So it means that when there are underlying developmental problems in the brain, there is an arachnoid cyst also which is going to be formed as a part of the developmental aberration. That's not, need not be the cause. So aphasia, including that of the landau cleftner syndrome, which we'll discuss in a later session, also has been associated with the presence of left sylvian arachnoid cysts. You know the sylvian region is important for language, so it may be related to this is a proposition, but again, very much unproved. Uh, 
Even in patients whom CT and MRA has failed to reveal a mass effect, PET has demonstrated hypermetabolism in speech area. So these are patients where you know surgery can be attempted. Post-operative improvement in PET studies corresponded to improvement in vocabulary in these patients. This is a very small number which has been reported. So management when symptoms warrant surgical intervention to decompress the cyst, including endoscopic management, that is fenestration of this uh, arachnoid cyst or shunting procedure is required. So when these arachnoid cysts occur with hydrocephalus, treating hydrocephalus with the shunt or other, other CSF diversion procedure may not may also be required. So in those without hydrocephalus, cyst fenestration, uh, fenestration would suffice. So if hydrocephalus is present, it is still recommended, but a V patient has to be placed if a hydrocephalus is marked or after fenestration, the hydrocephalus progresses. This is commonly seen. Uh, patients after uh, fenestration of a arachnoid cyst continue to develop signs of raised pressure. And when they are imaged, the hydrocephalus is still there and it is progressive. Then may, they may need a second procedure in the form of a CSF diversion. That is a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So let me conclude this session. I thank you for the attention. Let's discuss another session in another one of our classes. Thank you.